I'm going to have you take a stab at trying to define justification. What is justification? So we've, we've gone through prevenient grace, repentance, faith. This is the order of salvation. Now we're at the point where you know, our faith takes hold and something happens. We are justified, regenerated, justified, regenerated, adopted into the family of God. Okay. So let's first talk about justification. What is justification? We we are not actually holy, but I mean right. We God makes us right in the eyes of God. So we're not actually holy, but God declares us to be holy? Is that what justification means? Right. right. Like we, don't, we don't get any punishment. Okay, good. How would you define it, David? I would say like a legal term where God uh -huh. says that now you are right with me. Now you're not okay. guilty anymore. I'm just, you're just good. Good, good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, so if you, if you look down, you'll see in the notes, justification is a legal term, forensic term, that means acquittal. So think of yourself standing before the judge, and the judge says, you know what? You're free. Um, you know what? I declare you not guilty. You ever have a, a, a judgment by a judge declaring you guilty or not guilty? <laughs> well, uh, justification, it means that uh, you're standing before the judge. The judge declares the person not guilty. The charges are dropped and punishment no longer looms for the once guilty person. Yes, you were guilty, but now you're not. How in the world did that happen? There had to be someone to pay the price, to pay the fine. And that was Jesus. Someone who is justified has his slate wiped clean. He no longer has any sins to his account. The record is, 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 is all clear. You search the record, you go back into the files, and... Look, okay, let's look, at, let's look at his criminal record. Suddenly, no charges show up. He doesn't have a criminal history anymore. What? How did that happen? Someone wiped it clean. That's what happens in justification. This act of God whereby he declares us righteous. It's, it's God forgiving our sins, counting us righteous, no longer holding us accountable for our sin. That means you don't have to go to hell. That's wonderful. We, we need to be rejoicing in our justification. Well, what happens at the same exact time as when you are justified, as justification? That's what concomitant means, occurring with. Sanctification, yes, uh, if you're talking about initial sanctification. Um, the two big words we want to use as concomitants of justification are regeneration and, I mentioned it earlier, adoption. The, the big three, justification, regeneration, adoption. They occur simultaneously. So let's, let's keep going through these, these definitions. At the very same time you are justified, you are also regenerated. Okay? To whomever God imputes righteousness, he imparts righteousness. So we don't want to say, Akashi, that we aren't actually righteous, but God, make, God declares us righteous. Because when he declares us righteous, he also makes us righteous. But it's a different work different aspect of what he does in salvation. And I know you meant that, but your, 
what you're doing is, is pointing to what actually is done in that particular work. So I understand what you're saying. Okay, regeneration. To, rege to regenerate means to make new, to, to bring new life. To generate is to give birth. To regenerate is to give birth again. Kind of. <laughs> so when you and I are regenerated, we are born again. We're reborn. You've heard of rebirth, regeneration. Okay, so think, think along those lines. Obviously, it's a metaphor. Um, we don't go into our mama's valley again like Nicodemus wondered. <laughs> Uh, but Jesus said, you must be born again. And um, so, so you could say regeneration is an instantaneous work of God that brings spiritual life to a man and renews the fallen nature. So this is where the regeneration comes in. It's to be born again. It's man's partial restoration to the image of God. So let me take you to John Wesley's definition. He said, It is that great change which God works in the soul when he brings it into life, when he raises it from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. It is the change wrought in the whole soul by the Almighty Spirit of God when it is created anew in Christ Jesus, when it is renewed after the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. This great work of God. There's a change of the character of the soul. The heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. It's, it's a radical move within the interior of, of your life, of your heart. It's, it's, it's a change, a radical change. So it's not something just... You know, salvation, when salvation occurs, it's not just something that happens in the book somewhere, mm -hmm. but it happens inside. There's a relative change, as far as like a relational change, but also a real change. Okay? Two R's, relational versus real. There is a, a real change in, in my heart, and you've all felt it. You've all experienced it. You've, you've all... Understood, you all understand what it means to, to have a heart that, that was prone toward sin and, and the flesh and you know the, the works of the flesh. And now it's like, whoa, my desires are changed. I, 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 I want to I please God. I want to serve God. There's, there's a newness of life that happens when you are, are born again. So what's the difference between regeneration and justification how would you describe that difference we've, we've already talked about them but give me some quick set them up against each other see the thing is it, it's 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 not like they're fighting against each other because they're occurring simultaneously and they're when one occurs the other occurs as well but but they're pointing to different aspects of what happens in salvation so what's the difference? So, sorry. So, again, so regeneration makes us actually holy. Mm -hmm. And justification makes us righteous before God. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. James, what how would you say? The difference between the two. That's actually kind of what I was thinking when you said. Okay. Um, say it in a little different way. Huh. Justification doesn't make us holy. It just shows that we're righteous now in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. While regeneration is actually making us holy in the sight of God. And yeah, so we actually are righteous. So we actually are righteous and holy. We're made righteous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you say it any differently? Um, well, I'd say that regeneration is our being made holy, like we are okay. being holy before God, justification, it, uh, I don't know, after Romans and Galatians, I have a hard time saying that it makes us righteous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's kind of, goes against nature, but 
in a sense, yes, it makes us righteous, but it's it's by putting us of our sins. Okay. It's, mm -hmm. uh, the punishment is removed from us. It's not necessarily that we're you know complete that all our sins are completely removed from us because we did commit the sins, but we are forgiven and they are not held account we're not held accountable for the sins. And God's mm -hmm. wiping our slate clean. Okay, God's wiping our slate clean. He's not going to punish us. Whereas with regeneration, he's actually making us holy. Okay. So yeah, you could talk about it this way. Justification is that which God does for a person. Regeneration is that which God does in a person. So you could talk, I think, for versus in. You could say, in justification, God, God imputes righteousness and declares him righteous. In regeneration, God imparts righteousness or makes him righteous. So, impute versus impart. Uh, declare versus make. That makes sense? But, but they go together. They always go together. They're inseparable. And this, this is like a exact quote from uh, John, John Wesley who, who says, uh, to whomever God imputes righteousness, he imparts righteousness. So you don't, you don't separate the two. There's not a legal fiction going on. Yet it's important to preserve this concept of, of justification because you, you have to talk about this in a legal sense. Okay, and you have to talk about a particular point in time in which this happens. And, and this, this is a, a, good, a good time to talk about how Christ's righteousness is not, uh, it, it becomes our own, right? And um, I, I, know, I know sometimes people have a problem with saying, you know, us being clothed in, in Christ's righteousness, but there's a sense of which that's true because it's not our righteousness. I mean, it's, it is our righteousness, but it's Christ's righteousness becoming ours. And so I, would, I wouldn't ever dismiss the idea of imputation. Mm -hmm. I'd be careful with that because we don't ever want to suggest that his righteousness is apart from our righteousness. You know, it's all of ours. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's his. And, and there, there's the difference between... There is probably a difference between um, the, the, practi the, the, the righteousness as a practice, our, our, our weak attempts to, to do what's right. We don't, we're never going to quite measure up. Right? God does make us holy. He does make us righteous. And, you know, we're cooperating with his grace, yet we're never going to, even with his help, we're not going to measure up. And so it's, Jesus does make up the difference. There, there's a point that the Calvinists make here that there, there's some validity to what they're saying about the righteousness of Christ um, kind of standing between us and God. So, somehow he's... You know, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, um, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There, there's, even if we're walking in the light, we're, we're still never going to be measuring up. So there's, so there's sins of ignorance that need, still need to be cleansed. Right? We need to be kept cleansed from all sin. I mean, even, even the, the inmost depravity of sin we, we can be cleansed from. But the, the atonement, the blood, it, it, it's making up the difference. Even, even after he's done his work in us in regeneration, uh, there's, still, there's, still, there's, there's still a gap 
that, that, that Jesus fills in some way. And I don't want to talk like a, you know, like, this, like there's a, some kind of a legal fiction going on. But I think we, we do want to talk about imputation and being clothed with Christ's righteousness and, and him being our protection and so forth. Yeah. So, imputation, of course, with justification, it involves like a deposit that brings us up to zero, like takes care of all of our debts, right? Mm -hmm. Would you see it as ongoing also? Mm -hmm. So not just an initial deposit? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think so. Maybe I'm wrong, but... I think... I like cleansing terminology. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Failing terminology makes me a little more nervous, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I get hung up on words too much. You, you mean the... Okay, so uh, God doesn't see the the... the yeah. The, the manure pile, he just sees the snow on top of the manure pile. You know, he, sees, he doesn't really see me and all my sin. He sees, he sees Jesus. So Jesus stands between me and, and God, so I'm protected. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think that that's a pretty bad analogy, especially when you talk about it as a manure pile, because we believe the guy cleans up the manure pile. Um, I, I just, you know, clothed in his righteousness alone. I, what does that mean? I, I don't think that that's really talking about a, a legal fiction there. Um, but it is his righteousness. And, and somehow it is he that is, is making the difference in our life. And we can just rest in him. Because we'll never completely measure up, even as sincere as we are. It's always us resting on his, in his work, his, what he did as far as his active righteousness. He, he lives the sinless holy life. And then what he does in his passive uh, righteousness when he, uh, he suffers for us and um, makes atonement. So... I don't know. I don't. I don't want to be reactionary, yeah. so much. I do want to. I do want to push up, push against the extremes, the the problems with that whole imputation fallacy. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to get away from imputation entirely, yeah. and want to talk. I want to talk about justification somewhat in imputational terms. Mm -hmm. It's when he imputes righteousness to us. It's his righteousness. I mean, he cleans us. He, he, because of, it's because of his righteousness that our record is is able to be swept clean. Mm -hmm. sure. So, all right, we can think more about that and talk more about it. Maybe. Well, what about regeneration and sanctification? What's the difference there? You've heard of. Regeneration and initial initial sanctification, right? Um, which one fits within the other, or which one? What's the relationship between regeneration and sanctification? But let's let's think about. Sanctification being a, a life, a, a, a big category. This is an ongoing thing that includes initial, progressive, entire, ongoing, right? Think of, think of regeneration being the gate. It's initial sanctification. It's, it opens us up into a life of holiness. Okay? So, we should say that one is initially sanctified in regeneration. So the beginnings of sanctification occur in regeneration. Right? Regeneration is the gate or the entrance 
into the life of holiness. And this analogy may, may help a little bit here. Just as physical birth is instantaneous, so spiritual birth is instantaneous. It happens in a moment. Recognizing this will help us to see that regeneration cannot be equated with sanctification. Of course, justification can't be equated with sanctification either. Okay? Justification is not the long process that uh, Catholics tend to look at it as. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an act of God that occurs in a moment. And, and regeneration does as well. Though they both refer to sanctification and regeneration, both refer to the inner renewal of man, they're not the same. Though someone is gradually sanctified or made holy, and yet there's also entire sanctification, you know, a, a deeper cleansing of inherited depravity, one does not become gradually regenerated. We could say, however, that one is initially sanctified in regeneration. Okay. Now, what about scriptures on regeneration? Is there any scriptural support for this idea? Or is it just a theological construct? You know, there's lots of references to justification. We could have, we could have gone over, over all of those. But we were pretty familiar with uh, some of those passages. But what about regeneration? What, what verses come to your mind when you think regeneration? John 3. John 3. You, you must be born again, or born from above, yeah? Anything else? Any, any reference to regeneration, per se? I, I don't know what the like, exact words, but the Bible says the old man was crucified. No, like, going away and knew, yeah. Okay, that, that, that probably would work there. Yeah, that, that's good. Okay, so let me, let me give you this word, though. Uh, Titus 3, 5, the washing of regeneration. The washing of regeneration. That saves by the washing of regeneration. I think that's, that's probably the, the clearest... Where, where you actually have the word regeneration meant in that sense. You know, it can be used in other ways, but another way. Um, Hebrews 10, 22, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And I'm going to take this in a spiritual sense here. Uh, the, the, the baptism. What baptism re represents is a spiritual cleansing. What, what physical baptism represents is a spiritual cleansing, a, a renewal, a washing. Right? John 3 3, one must be born again. 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you are a new creature. You are born again. What's that song? I am a new creation. I've been born again. You don't know that? Old things have passed away. I'm newborn I am more than a conqueror. That's what I am. I'm a new creation. I've been born again. You guys need to know some of these old songs. Yeah. Here's, here's the character of one who's born again. He has assurance of salvation. So someone who experiences regeneration will usually experience the witness of the Spirit, assurance of salvation. And we'll talk about that later. Love for God and for one another. So if you look up 1 John 3.14, it talks about how, I mean, this, is, this would be proof. I mean, if you're not loving the brethren, then you're, you're not born again. Uh, we know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that does not love his brother abides in death. Um, 
And then power over willful sin. He that commits sin, he that practices willful sin, is of the devil. So someone who is, uh, this is how you tell the difference between a, someone who was born of God and someone who is not. The one who's born of God uh, practices righteousness. The one who is not born of God practices sin. Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, according to 1 John 3, 9. Okay. And then, one more thing, adoption. Adoption occurs at the same time we are justified and regenerated. When we're born again, we become part of God's family. So we're born into the family of God and adopted into the family of God, which is it? It's both, right? Somehow. Now, we have to obviously clarify that um, we're not a son of God in the same way that the son of God is, the, the Jesus, the, the, the God the son is. So we're, we're sons of and daughters by grace or by adoption, whereas God the Son is the Son by nature. He is one in nature with the Father. But we have the privilege of becoming part of the family of God. And this is, a, is, is metaphorical language. And uh, earthly adoption includes receiving the full rights of a son, right? I mean, you know what adoption means. It's I, I admire those who, would, who adopt, adopt kids, give them a new life. In the same way, in our spiritual adoption, God grants us all the rights and privileges that come with being his children. Isn't that good to know? We're adopted into his family. Justified, regenerated, and adopted. And if we've been adopted into his family... The Spirit testifies to our adoption. And this is where we're going to end today, but this, this leads us into a discussion of assurance. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God.